You're listening to Making a Living Show. I'm Roby Levy. Hi, my name is Benny Bing, and I make portraits for a living. Toronto-based Benny Bing is a self-taught artist of Nigerian descent. With his colorful, large-scale portraits, Benny emphasizes positive representations of black women. His work has shown at major art fairs, exhibitions, and museums, and he has created commissions for the likes of Dave Chappelle, The Weeknd, and Milis Raonic. Here's my chat with Benny Bing. Who are you and what do you make for a living? Uh, my name is Benny Bang. I'm a portrait artist and I paint predominantly black women as part of my discipline. Tell me how you got started doing this. So uh, this is a very interesting story. Um, interesting in the sense that I have never painted before. Um, so I've been creative as, as, as a human, as a, as a kid and later on in life, but I've never actually picked up a brush and paint. Let's rewind back to 2014, Christmas. It was the first Christmas with um, my wife, my current wife and I uh, going to France to meet her parents. And um, her and her mom decided to get a little gift for Christmas. And uh, I I believe because it was the first year, they didn't want to get anything too too expensive. And they wanted to get... Didn't know if you'd be sticking around, right? Yeah, (laughs) exactly, exactly. (laughs) They wanted to get something, you know, uh, that something that, you know, just means something. So, uh, I remember she, she told me that she told her mom, I know he's creative. Um, so the mom decided, which is my mother in law decided to buy me acrylic paint. It's one of these, uh, 12 pack acrylic paints, you know, very small tubes. And, um, I was very excited, you know, for Christmas because this is first Christmas spending with my wife's family. And, you know, they're big on Christmas. I wasn't really big on Christmas in, in my family. It was mostly uh, uh, the celebration of, of Jesus' birth because we're Christians. For them, it's more Christmas, Christmas. Right. The whole pomp and circumstance, the family fun, Food, all that everything, kind of stuff. right? Uh, and they're French, so they go all out. Um, so everyone's exchanging gifts, and I get this gift. And I'm thinking to myself, well, oh, wow, I got something. And I look at it as a critic paint. And I thought to myself, okay. Uh, not a problem. I'm going to, you know, when I get back to Toronto, I'm going to use this and just paint anything. And, um, but at the back of my head, you know, I'm thinking to myself, there's all kinds of gifts you can get me. There's, I mean, there's, a, there's wine, there's cognac, there's all kinds of things to get, but acrylic paint, I never knew, you know, I never thought about it uh, in that way. But I, I, I'm a firm believer in um, being appreciative and gratitude, you know, showing gratitude. And I took that and I said, you know what, I'm going to use this. I'll never forget. Super Bowl 2015, February 1st. I was home with my wife and we were watching a game and I bought a canvas uh, earlier that weekend and I just started painting. I said, I'm going to use every single color in this 12 paint set um, to the best I can. And I started and it became very addictive. I just kept on going at it and going at it. And I'll finish one painting and I start another. And I remember at the time when I first started, I actually had a palette knife and one brush with, with no... I had a lot no, of cleanup. <laughs> I didn't even have an easel. Uh, and I remember uh, it was, I was using the dining, dining table and the chair to, to stick the, the canvas up against it. It, it, was, it was one of these crazy uh, setups. And, uh, and it just it, it started from there. And it just, I just kept on getting better. And I think what it was is more, I, be, I saw something in it and something in myself that I hadn't seen ever in my life. And I can't explain the feeling. It's one of those things that, that I can't explain. But I just kept on coming back from work every single day and just going directly to the canvas. Now, that first painting, though, how did you even know what you were going to paint? I mean, what was it a picture of? Uh, it was a, it was a, a portrait. It was, it, it was a portrait of, of a lady. Um, the funny thing is my best friend's wife is the one who actually bought it <laughs> and they, they have it in their home. So every time we go over, you know, I, I, I get this constant reminder of my first painting. Yeah, it was just a portrait. And I think what drew me towards portraits, cause when I sketch, I'm pretty, fairly good at sketching. Uh, so I, I wanted to stick to something that I was good at. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really a abstract type of person or a landscape type of person. So I wanted, I just stuck with portraits and I decided to use every color. So that's why I started, you know, creating this very colorful portraits, por- portraits, instead of using regular skin tone, I started using different colors, blues and, and purples and, and lavender and, 
the orange and yellow and red and very vibrant colors. And uh, it just kind of stood out and it became a thing where I kind of, my style evolved out of that. Well, tell me how you developed it further. I mean, did you just keep painting and painting and painting and painting and, and things just sort of fell into place or did you at some point take a lesson? Did you learn art history or did you, did you open up a book or call up a local artist to say, you know, hey, give me, give me a couple of tips and technique or something? Or did you just paint and paint and paint? So at, at first it was just, I come back from work and I would just paint and paint and paint. And. However, I decided, you know, I, I'm going to go on YouTube and look up some videos on some people that can inspire me and kind of um, feed this, this creative drive that I had. So I discovered um, an artist called Nelly Francois. She's from France and also Boca, and he's Austrian. And uh, they, they, are, they use a lot of color in their work also. So that was, I was very drawn to these two specifically. They, were, they are and have always been my, my biggest inspiration. And I started um, mimicking their style by the same time using it as a, as a way to practice and then eventually kind of improve on my own uh, and form my own style. Um, but it was, to be honest with you, it's, it's really just practice. It was, you know, putting in the work. That was really what it was. It's sitting in front of the canvas and putting in the work. 10,000 hours. Exactly. And time <laughs> over time, uh, I was just getting better and better from the very first painting to, you know, the first 10 paintings is a huge difference because it was just constantly, I was constantly seeking to be better. Uh, and just searching for to improve the style um, and kind of let my creativity um, run amok and take me wherever it wanted me to go. Now, ju just to give some context here for a second, you when you say you never painted before, you literally had never picked up a brush before. That's correct. What line of business were you in before you were a painter? Uh, so I was in digital marketing. Uh, I worked for a small firm. Um, and which is also where I met my wife. And I loved what I did. I helped, I, you know, I helped a lot of um, small and medium-sized businesses, mostly mom and pop stores and businesses, um, improve their digital footprint and help them use the internet to the best of their ability to um, increase revenue uh, and increase revenue streams. Uh, so I, I, did, I really loved what I did. But when I started painting, it's... And when I say I never picked up a brush, I've never picked up a brush ever. So when I, the, the, and it's quite hard, you know, using a brush versus using a pen or a pencil. So when I actually picked up the brush, there was just, there was something in it. I said, you know what, I'm just going to keep on going. And, I, and I'm a firm believer that you always, I'm always open to learn. And for me, learning is key. And until this day, I'm still learning at what, you know, what I do and, and, how to improve and how to get better and how to be, even be a better human being, right? So it's, it's the constant, uh, constant learning. So the, the, a lot of the fundamentals I learned and I actually, the same advice I gave my clients when I was in my nine to five at the time, my, my first career, is what I implemented into my second career in my business. Um, so it was, I, was, I was able to use all those tools and knowledge as, uh, to jumpstart my second career, if you want to put it that way. Well, and, and you refer to it as your first career and your second career. You are now no longer involved in anything but making art. You are a painter through and through. Is that right? That is correct. So no day job, no nine to five. That's right. Well, at least no nine to five going to an office and doing digital marketing. That's right. What made you shift gears and go, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm done with my first career and I want to pursue this professionally. I want to be exclusively a painter, an artist. What was that moment like? So um, before, before I, I, I say this, I want to put this out there. Um, I've never met a person I could learn something from. So every single person I meet to me is a learning experience. And I try to keep friends in all different age groups, younger than me, same age as me, and older than me. Um, and the reason, because you can gain so much knowledge from different people. Now, that being said, while I was still practicing and, you know, working my nine to five, uh, my first career, I was taking all, you no, know, I started selling these paintings to friends and family members. And some people were just on social media at the time on, on Instagram, were just buying the paintings. So every single, you know, uh, revenue I was making from that, I was just put into savings account uh, because 
you know, <laughs> everything was fine. This is just extra money. So I was putting it in there. And I remember um, my neighbor, uh, he used to be my neighbor over here, John McCubbin. Um, he, uh, he's a fairly older gentleman. I think he's in his 60s. And he had retired um, from Bay Street. And he was um, in the business at the time of doing um, motivational talks on, on the corporate level. And we you know we struck up a conversation of, and a friendship just in the neighborhood. You know, me walking the dog, and he said, and I told him you know everything I was doing, and he you know saw my stuff. And over time we spoke, he says, "Hey, don't you ever think of quitting your job and doing this full time?" And it was just a seed that he planted and just said it. And I was I was like, "Hmm, you know, okay, this sounds like a good idea." Um, and I thought about it for a couple of days, and I went back to him again and I asked him, "So." I, I, no, I really like that idea. Now, the question is, how do I do it, right? And he, he kind of gave me this little formula. Uh, and the funny thing is, <laughs> I actually went to go see him recently. He moved. He now lives in Prince Edward County outside of Toronto. And I went to see him, and I told him, do you remember the conversation we had? And he says, I remember planting the seed, but I don't remember exactly the conversation. And I kind of repeated it back to him. And he kind of gave me this idea, you know, pretty much create a safety blanket for six months and quit you have six months to do what you need to do and if you don't succeed you jump back into the workforce and if you do your life will never be the same again so all the money that i had been saving from you know selling the paintings on the side plus also you know, additional savings i decided this is a good time and i quit my job and uh, once i quit i have never looked back my life has never been the same and thanks to him and uh, he, and I, you know, I, when I saw him recently, I told him, I said, you know, it's, it's, it's quite amazing how the, the, the person you least expect or, uh, or the people you least expect are the ones that plant the most powerful seeds in you. The question is, are you listening? Did you ever buy your mother-in-law a thank you gift? I hope you did. <laughs> I did something even better. Um, I, I painted that uh, it was when I started my women of, of, of um, women of color collection. Um, I, I actually told her she can pick anyone that she wanted, any painting. And she picked, you know, um, there's a painting called, uh, painting called Maqueda. And she picked that one and is actually in her home in, in the South of France. So I'm very happy that she actually, you know, she has one. And for years, she didn't want to take anything from me. She didn't, we, you know, we tried to buy several things for her. And she's like, no, 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 no. So I was like, you know what? I told my wife, forget about it. We'll, um, you know, make her pick one. We're going to make her pick one. And when we go down, we're going to literally take it there and install it for her. So that's what we did. That seems like a perfect thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's a majestic piece. It's about, I think it's about four feet by five feet. It's, it's a big, huge piece. And it's the centerpiece in her home, so I'm quite happy that you know she has that. Even my, no, my, her, um, my my father-in-law also has one in his home, and you know it's it's a good feeling to see to see my pieces, you know, in people's homes that have inspired and and driven me to become who I am right now. Well, and speaking of inspiration, obviously there was that th these couple of nuggets you're talking about uh, from your friend who told you how to how to shift gears. Obviously, your mother-in-law sent you on set you on this path, but your work itself, where are you finding inspiration? What is driving you to choose your subjects and to, and to create? Well, my inspiration comes from, first, internally, I, 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 I'm trying to become a better human being and tell better stories. And, um, and, I, and when I looked at, because I used to paint celebrities when I first, first started. So, if it, so as and I'm sure some of your listeners will, will probably go on my website and check out some of my work or on Instagram, they will notice there was a good part of my career, I think about a year and a half, where I painted celebrities. And there wasn't necessarily any meaning in that. And it's fun to have, you know, to paint, you know, Ray Charles or Rihanna or Mike Tyson. However, there's, there's, um, there isn't a strong message behind it. And what does that mean? What is my purpose on this earth? Because I believe in purpose. So what is my purpose and, and how can I manifest that of what I'm doing? Because it's quite interesting that all of this happened after I turned 30. 
after I changed my mindset. And I felt that, you know, this is a reason. There's a reason why all of this happens and why everything's happened the way it is. So I felt, you know, my purpose is, is to tell our stories, our stories meaning black stories in contemporary art. When I look at contemporary art and subjects in contemporary art, a lot of them are white. And the story is, is a one-sided story. But how can we now, you know, in, be inclusive and tell every, everyone's story? And so there's this void, especially of black female subjects in contemporary art. So what I felt was an important need to show the beauty and show the humanity in these subjects. Because, you know, I say this all the time, there is a saying um, that, you know, this is a quote by uh, Dr. Jeffries. He's a professor in a, a call in a university in the U.S. And he said, he who controls the images controls the esteem. And I think that's key for young black girls. If they don't see themselves in a very positive light, they grow up with a lack of self-esteem. So, you know, whether it's in print media or it's in movies or, you know, commercials and any type of, you know, you always see black females being portrayed a specific type of way. Now, how can we change that story? How do we change that narrative, right? And that's true little things like this, right? Which is capturing black women in very regal, powerful um, ways. And that's what I decided to take, uh, to take on. So I, I literally stopped painting celebrities and decided it was important for me to start painting black women. And it just took off. It was, I called my, the collection was called Women of Color. And I started with a head wrap series, which the head wrap symbolized uh, like a crown sitting on their heads. And each subject was named after the word queen in an African language or actual African queens that a lot of people, black and white, are not quite knowledgeable on because you know these are not thought these queens are not thought about in schools they're, they're not mentioned in movies they, you know they're not really celebrated so i wanted to have it be a way to also educate the public on these powerful queens or warriors or what the word queen means in some of the, some of these languages uh so it just took off on its own this is all due to social media <laughs> and you know people wanting this type of content and to see the beauty and, I, and to be honest with you, what motivates me is to see the smiles on people's faces and to see the responses when people see the work. And I remember one couple from uh, New Orleans. I met them here in Toronto at a festival and they bought a painting and they bought the painting specifically for their daughter because they wanted her to see herself every single day when she was walking out of the house going to school. And to be proud of who she is, be proud of her hair, be proud of her, her, her features, her, you know, her full lips and her nose and her high cheekbones and all these different features that sometimes, you know, or most times we're, we're castigated for years for these things. So that to me is what inspires me. The result of how, I, how it makes, the, how it makes the, the, the audience feel when they look at the subjects that I paint. Have you ever questioned or have you ever been questioned about a man doing this type of work, telling these types of stories? Has that ever come into play, um, be it from one of your subjects or perhaps somebody uh, who's viewed your work? Um, it hasn't come up from anyone, but I have talked about it. Um, I, I think people are too, <laughs> they don't want to disrespect me in, in, in any way. Uh, I, I think that's what it is. And, and also I think people are just, uh, you know, unfortunately, people are, um, they try to create a celebrity behind who I am, um, which happens in, in art. You know, a lot of artists become celebrities and become bigger than their works than actually the work speaking for itself. And what I've always taken the position of being behind my work and letting the work, you know, speak for itself. Uh, some people need, didn't even know who I was. Um, and it's like, oh, you're, you're Benny? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but, so I've always said I'm I'm just an instrument being used to tell the story. 
And do you ever actually question you being used as an instrument? I mean, do you ever run into a, a, a doubt or a question and sit there and go, ah, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing enough? Am I doing it right? Never, never. Well, uh, am I doing it right? Yes. So depending on, on the content, sometimes I question what I'm doing and is it right? So certain ways I paint, do I, because I never want to sexualize my subjects, right? So w when, I, when I'm, you know, approaching a specific model or I'm looking at a you know, specific painting and I'm looking at, is, is, this, is, this, is, this, sex, is this being over-sexual? Um, is this sexualizing the subject? Um, or uh, um, there was one, so one painting I specifically I, I wanted to paint was a, a black girl with a um, indigenous head head um, head headgear, and you know well, is that right? Um, if the subject not being indigenous, um, and so you know those are the type of things you want to you want to celebrate indigenous culture. However, you want to be very careful how you celebrate it. Right. Um, I'll write a painting an indigenous woman than a black woman wearing an indigenous um, head, head, headgear. Right. So, so, when, so I question myself. Absolutely. Do you think that's to the benefit of your art or to the detriment? In other words, there's a lot of schools of thought, obviously. The part of the purpose of it is to get a reaction, a good, a bad, anything in between. Is your preference to have good reaction, a positive reaction versus a negative? Uh, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Um, I take a conscious effort to have a positive message. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, I know controversy sells and the art industry loves controversial work and that gets you being talked about. However, I don't subscribe to that thinking. I am I'm, I'm, I'm very much would love to, um, for my work to be a global thing and, and for my name to be a global name in every household. However, to be more of a be coming from a positive um, than than a controversial, right? Um, so uh, it's all about positivity for me. It's because that transfers, that's energy, right? And that transfers, and people see it, and people feel it. And you know, we can have discussions about the work, and we can have discussions that are touchy, not controversial, just touchy. So the conversation goes on. Um, however, I'm not, I'm not for the controversy, unfortunately, I'm not. So someone did say, Hey, why don't you paint Donald Trump when he was inaugurated? And I said, to be honest with you, um, because the person said, Oh, you painted Obama, you know, when I was painting the celebrity. And I said, I'm really, I'm switching from celebrities to you no know, a specific, uh, type I'm focusing on black women. And um, unfortunately, even Donald Trump is not somebody I, I would love to paint because there's nothing positive about about painting him. You know, Obama brought people hope, you know, in, in some sense. And he's always been this figure that people have looked up to, right? So I wanted, you know, that's something. But however, someone like, like you know, like Trump, there was, this is during his inauguration. So this is before the four years of what we would now see happen. But I didn't want... I didn't want that to be, people wanted me to paint it because it would, it, would, it would bring about controversy and people would post it everywhere and people want to know who I am. But what I decided instead was to paint a black Muslim woman in an American flag hijab, which was titled United We Stand. And this was a play off of um, Shepard Farley's piece. And... Um, you know, it, 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 it we're looking at three minority groups, a woman, a Muslim, and um, a, a black person uh, with the Bill of Rights in the background. Uh, and now that that piece has actually been on tour for the past two to th two, three years with the um, Normal Rockwell Museum in, in Massachusetts as part of uh, their uh, tour of um, the Four Freedoms. They did the, the four freedoms that Norman Rockwell painted and reimagined where they had different, paint, uh, different artists reimagine Norman Rockwell's four freedoms. And that's one of the pieces. And it's, it's been torn all over the U.S. And to, to me, that was more, that's more powerful and has a bigger message. But because, you know, it's, it's, it's better when, we, when we're united than when we are, we're not. And this is better than controversy. Right, but what are you hoping to achieve long term? Uh, um, long term, it's um, for me, it's more of 
having my work changed uh, the way we look at each other um, in terms of showing the humanity and who we are and telling our stories. I think uh, it's important to tell stories. Um, and that's what I really want my work to do is being able to be able to show people and educate people that there's more to the world than what we normally see. Or what, uh, you know, so that's what I, in, in a grand scheme of things, that's what I will really love. However, I do know that my work might not be uh, you know, Damon Hurst or, uh, you know, Jeff Coons or any of these people, uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I do, I do pray and hope that it gets into the global um, sphere where people understand the power behind the work, you know, just exactly like what Amy Sherald and Kainde Wiley's work currently is doing. It's changing per uh, perceptions and is, is having people look at the beauty in, in these subjects and who we are. Because the moment you do see, you start to see the beauty in humanity it changes the way you interact with people. Right, changes attitude, right? Because attitude is a big thing for me. Um, it's our it's it's our attitude towards others that would determine the attitude towards us, right? Um, so I'm a firm believer in that, and and that's that's my whole attitude towards other people is also just, you know is also important. So uh, that's what I'm looking for. It's one thing to work daily at your craft. It's one thing to uh, get better at it. And it's one thing to be pro prolific in terms of output. But how is it that you get your stuff out there? I mean, I've got to assume that you're falling back on some of your digital marketing days in order to get your work in front of people. Is that right? That's right. Um, so in order to answer that question, I think it's important to, to, to point this out. Um, because I am, I, I'm self-taught, I didn't go to school for this. I haven't taken any courses except whatever I saw online or on YouTube. Uh, but also, interestingly enough, I did meet a, a very kind gentleman uh, who became one of my mentors too. Um, he sat me down and was able to mentor me and give me all the advice of what to expect and what I need to do um, in order to be on the right track. So uh, and to be honest with you, it was, it was a blessing because if not for him, I would have probably wasted a lot of money, you know, trying to get my work out there, but being you know, eaten up by vultures because there are a lot of vultures in this in industry that are looking just to make money off of you. They don't care about your art. And, um, you know, his, his advice allowed me to maneuver and, and the true all that and, and, and really put myself out there. Uh, but a lot of it had to do with um, my mindset and basically working. It's, I, for me, it's, it's constant, constant work. And the, the great thing about it is, you know, work is more fun for me than fun, right? <laughs> so uh, I enjoy um, sitting in front of the canvas. I enjoy painting for, for hours. Um, I'm putting in that, it's all about hard work. Um, but taking the knowledge, because I never stop asking questions and I never stop learning. So taking all that knowledge I learned along the way, um, especially in my, in my first career and implementing that into my business right from the get-go. So, you know, you know, increasing my visibility online because when we look at the gallery system, which um, my mentor explained to me, it's, it's been, uh, it's on its last legs. Yeah, we're currently right now in the same space um, of what the music industry was was like in the early 2000s during when Napster was you know, really putting a, thickening it to them. Uh, that's currently what's happening because of the internet um, and the fact that you can actually create your own collector list. You can actually market and promote yourself with different tools that are available online. Um, so you don't really necessarily need representation or a gallery. What sort of tools are you using that are particularly helpful? So uh, social media, first of all, um, uh, mostly Instagram for me. However, there's Pinterest. Uh, and I think it's important to know your demographic and then market to the demographic on the specific networks that are out there. So my, my main is, in, is Instagram. However, Pinterest works because my clientele is predominantly young women. And that's also 
that demographic is on Pinterest. So, you know, using all these different tools out there, some might be Facebook, some of them might be TikTok. I currently mentor a, a wonderful artist who is very similar to myself because he quit his job in January 2020. And uh, we started talking and I told him, just run with it. And he's doing m magnificently well. And he's, he has a lot of great success on TikTok because he creates, he shows behind the scenes of his paintings. And he has this, this way he displays them in his TikTok videos, millions, millions of, of views and, and uh, TikTokers, subscribers that watch his videos. And, you know, so he, he found the medium that works for him. Um, so you kind of have to find a medium that works for you. And is that just experimenting? Is that just, you know, messing around until you find something that kind of seems to resonate? Absolutely. Right. Um, being on all, you know, you, you can figure out, you know, which ones work for you and then, you know, kind of, you know, double down and, uh, on, on the one that you're seeing the best results coming from. However, let's be honest, um, all these social networks are all in it for the money. So you can't beat the algorithm. So you have to pay uh, to, of course, get the results you're looking for. Uh, so it's also, you know, part of that is understanding, you know, do you know you have to get a marketing budget that can fit within, you know, the, you know what you're looking looking to accomplish. So do you boost posts and stuff like that? You Absolutely. Actually, how often do you do that? Uh, for me, uh, I do it once a month. However, because I had a show coming up um, this year, a digital show. I, I did it, uh, it was about, we ran a campaign for six weeks, which is the longest. I, I would normally run it for about a week or two, but this was the longest I ran it for. And, and it, it, it produced substantial results. I'm wondering, whenever I'm scrolling down through Facebook, through Instagram or, or, or what have you, you know, sometimes I'm put off by seeing something that is sponsored or has a you know, has a promoted element to it and stuff like that. Do you ever run into any worries with that? Or, or has anybody ever, you know, kind of shot back and said, what are you doing here? Or any negativity from it at all? Or is it, is it just mostly net out nice stuff for you? Um, so there's absolutely, absolutely there's negativity from it. Um, even myself, when I see some ads, I'm thinking to myself, why are you sending me this? But I'm the type of person, I would never say anything to the person because I know they're just doing whatever they got to do. But I would go in there and I would tell, you know, I would, you know, tell Instagram, this is irrelevant to me. Uh, so, it ne so it never comes up on my timeline again. <laughs> yeah, um, I do that all the time yeah. too. I'm uh, like, so people, irrelevant, irrelevant, yeah, irrelevant. Exactly. But most of the time I just ignore them. Do you think people ignore these, these boosted posts? Absolutely. People ignore them. However, um, I, I do see more of a positive than a negative from it. That's one. Two, there are people that will comment and, you know, because now it's been, it's been uh, advertised to them, they will go in there and say, oh, this is crap or I might, you know, my kid can do this. And, and it's fine. You know, you can say what you want to say. However, I choose not to respond to you, right? So someone said, oh, why is it that you, do, you don't just paint the faces with the regular skin tone? They will look 10 times much better. And I was just like, well, if I'm not going to respond to that because then that's, you know, putting the energy out there that I don't, I don't want to. And I probably not, if this individual took just two seconds of his time to listen to anything I've ever said, or, you know, any article that was written about me, he will understand the reason for the colors. So it, it, there's no need to respond to everybody. I think when you think of responding to every single thing, that's where you start to dig this rabbit hole and it gets deep. And so beyond social and, and posting and, and boosting ads at times, running campaigns. What other things are you doing to get the word out about your work? Uh, another thing I do, it's, it's my partnership with the private sector. So part of what I realized is since the industry is, um, what's the nice way to say this? <laughs> um, it's a club. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it's a members only club. Um, however, I'm not a big fan of a club, and uh, I'm, I, and if I'm not invited, that's fine. I will form my own club or find a different way to get you know to to sell my products. It's just the way it is. So what I decided to do was uh, take a different approach, and and part of the approach is uh, I, I I worked with Daniel's um, Artscape, um, which is a wonderful organization, arts organization, and they. Uh, produced my second show back in 20, 2016. And while there, I met 
Mitchell Cohen, who is the uh, CEO of Daniel's Corp, the, the great developer in Toronto. And they are the ones responsible for a lot of the condos in the Regent Park community, which I live in. And we struck up a you know, conversation and, you know, he's a huge fan and he loved the work. And he's like, you know, th- you know we would definitely love to partner up and work with you in implementing art, local art within the community in, in our buildings. And we, you know, we, we've had that relationship for years. And, you know, my work is in a couple of day condos. I, I do all this stuff with them. And it's that part of being involved in the community and that, partner, that corporate partnership that has taken things to a different level. Um, and, I, and I started, you know, looking at that as a great opportunity to get my work out there, not just because, you know, they, they, they own a good part of my collection because of that. Um, and then, you know, they introduced me to other people when we go, you know, for the events and I meet other people. And in that, in that sector, you're using, you know, I'm using my, my relationships in the private sector to boost, you know, my, my art. So, you know, a lot of companies are looking to, to, uh, to, to show their commitment to local art in Toronto and in Canada. And if galleries are not opening their doors, then we have to find a different way. And that's the way that has worked so far. Do you also go to markets? I mean, have you ever participated in that sort of an event? Early on in my career, yes, I did a, I did a lot of them. Um, unfortunately, I never did the Toronto outdoor, though. Uh, I, I'm just going to put this on there. It's not, no hard feelings towards you guys. I know you guys <laughs> never yeah, never accepted me, but that's completely be fine. Um, just put it out there. We'll see what happens. <laughs> um, uh, but I did a lot. I did a lot of uh, Kensington, um, the Kensington Art Art Fair uh, during the summertime and on the on the pedestrian Sundays. I did uh, Liberty uh, Liberty Village Art Crawl. Um, I also did the Artist Project that is every year. So I, I locally, I've, I've put myself out there. And the fairs were a great way uh, at the time to get myself um, known and, um, and to get my work sold. Now, some of these events, I never sold anything. Um, but the mindset is, uh, is not that you're going to sell. It's that your exposure is going to grow. And from that, people will also remember and they will come. They'll come back. They might not make a decision right now, but... Uh, you know, they will make a decision later. It's pretty much like a like a Super Bowl ad, right? You don't expect anyone to go buy the exact product, you know, that you know the next day. No, but over the period of time, over you know six months, you you see an increase in sales, which all those fairs did a good job for me. What's been the toughest part uh, about getting yourself out there, getting known, and forging these relationships that have been so positive? But you know, it must be hard in the beginning. What was the toughest part, and how'd you get over it? So. Uh, the toughest part has, has been being being told no. That is the toughest part, where you know um, you know that your your work is great. You know that people are buying your work, and you apply. You know you you look for you, you know you look to get your work out there. You look to for you know what might be representation with certain galleries or getting you know being put into a group show and being told no. Um, that was that's a tough part. Um, rejection. There we go. That was the word I was looking for. Rejection is the is the hardest part. Um, however, not taking that and creating your own pity party and you know uh, going to everyone say, "Look what they did." No, it's taking it, learning from it, taking that energy and converting it into painting your next best piece, and just keep producing and keep putting work out there. And eventually, it will work. And one thing I've realized, and I, and I tell myself, in, in, the way I handle rejection is, if I didn't get it, it wasn't for me, right? right? Whether, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, sometimes you get something and it's bad, but that's, that's basically for you to learn a very important lesson. So, uh, or if it's really good, then it's really good, and it you know, opens up all, all these other opportunities. I look at it at everything as a learning experience. So if I didn't get it, definitely wasn't for me. And I'm going to notice down the road, that was the reason why it was not for me. Because, you know, something happened or somebody got screwed or something. You know, it happens all the time. We hear about it all the time. So, you know, I, I did get a, an email one time from a gallery in Miami. And they were like, oh, yeah, we love your work. Um, 
pay us three grand and we will showcase your work during our battle. So I was naive to this. And I remember running by my mentor. I said, hey, um, this gallery just contacted me saying, uh, you know, they'll show my work during our basil, and I got to pay them three grand. He's like, don't, don't, don't do, just delete the email. Do not <laughs> respond to that email. <laughs> that is a scam. That is a, a vanity gallery. They're the vultures of our industry. They would, they, you're not going to get anything from this. You spend so much money and you're not, you're not going to get anything. Is there a lot of that that goes on? Oh yeah, absolutely. A lot. A lot. And, you know, it's all about, you know, you pay them, they don't really do anything. They just put your work up in a gallery and you have to pay, you know, you got to pay for your trip down to Miami. You got to pay for hotel rooms, drew an art, art basil, which is expensive. And then you get there and nothing sells, nothing, nothing happens. And you just, you know, out three grand, you don't make any returns on your investment. There's nothing. So, you know, that I realized like, that was, that's not for me. Right. So these things are not, you know, you start to learn along the way. Um, but yeah, part, the hardest part has been, has been rejection, um, of, of not being invited to the table. You know, that's, that's pretty tough because I, I, okay. So I will get into this. I, I did, I, I said I wasn't going to do it this show, but you no, know, forget about it. You know, gloves are off. So there was this year, there was, uh, an art there was a, a gentleman on, on Instagram who put together a spreadsheet of what representation looks like in the Toronto art industry. So he surveyed the top 16, top 16 galleries and wanted to find out what, you know, what is the breakdown of the artists that he represent. And so, you know, he broke down black, indigenous, uh, other persons of color um, and women, these four groups. And out of of all the, the 16 galleries, they represent 400 and I believe 53 artists. 10 of those are black, 10. Uh, indigenous is about two. Other people of color was like 30, 30 something. And women was about 144. So, so you know, when you look at that, that is not reflective of the city that we call Toronto and we live in. Uh, and you know, people said people, and then you know, the whole um, anti-black racism uh, protest and, and, and movements uh, came to the forefront and people started asking, you know, what do you feel? And, you know, I was, I was, I was very honest with people. Uh, I quite frankly don't care anymore. This is something that we have known for years that, uh, you know, in the community, none of these 10 people that, that they represent are Canadians. And what does that mean for uh, not just BIPOC artists or female artists, but what does that mean for artists in general coming out from schools like OCAD uh, and looking for a career and trying to build their way in the arts industry? What does that mean? And, you know, a lot of them, you know, put up black squares on their social and talked about let's have talks and all this. And, you know, to me, it's all performative. So if you're not being invited to the, t- don't, don't invite me to the table to have a discussion about what it means to be a BIPOC artist or a black artist in Toronto. I don't care to have that discussion with you. Let's talk about the real conversation, which is equity, right? Let's, let's, let's sit down and let's see how you can look at it and discovering the new talent, whether black, indigenous, you know, other people of color, women, or even white males in the city that can, you, you can grow. You know, there, there is a thing about, we don't look for artists in the city, we look for artists outside the city. So a lot of the artists, you know, in, in the galleries in Toronto are who was blown in the US and you're bringing it back to sell to us versus why don't you look for the talent here, have them blow it as a new, we, we, we don't even have the new, you know, group of seven. Are we looking towards, you know, becoming, you know, informing that again? Who are the new group of seven, right? We're being flooded with American art. How how about we export our own, our own art? That's the conversation I, I would rather have. Uh, so, you know, that's for me. It's all well and good to for you to be performing. However, we do know what's happening, and meaningful conversations and equity happens at the table. And if you're not invited to that table, then it's very important to not complain about the table. And find all the ways that you can actually build your own table. Might not be as big, but hey, it's still a table. 
And so what is it you're doing and folks you know, other artists, are you guys coming together? Are you forming this new or alternative table? So uh, for me, it's always been, you know, pr the private sector, um, utilizing the private sector to help um, government, um, the, Toronto, the, the Ontario um, Arts Council, um, and also putting together, uh, come together as a collective of artists to start to not wait and start to act more team up with each other, use our, our, our collective bargaining to, and co uh, connections to produce events. So what does that look like? And I, I, the reason I ask is because so much uh, art is made on one's own. I mean, most artists are artists on their own. They're not partnerships. They're not certainly not generally not groups. And, you know, how are you guys finding each other and how are you coordinating in order to make a positive change or for that matter, at least to get people to take notice that there's an issue here? So, um, so that, that's a very cool question. One of the one of it is organizations, for example, like Artscape, that have these art artistic communities that artists can come together in different from different um, disciplines and uh, co either collaborate or uh, exchange ideas. Um, but when it comes to uh, performance, the, the city also has been putting out a lot of money this year, uh, put a lot of a lot of calls for with an emphasis on marginalized communities and equity seeking groups. And so that's, that's one step. Um, but I think the, the real solution is actually going to come from the private sector um, and, and, the, uh, and the province and the city in funding um, spaces for black uh, and marginalized or uh, equity seeking groups. So that we, see, we, saw, we saw some investments by the city of Toronto um, that was made to the near center of art for the arts, which is a, a black uh, center, an art, arts organization. So we're seeing that you know the more spaces that they are, the better it is, uh, the better opportunities that um, BIPOC artists have to showcase their work. So that's that's one avenue, um, and the rest of it is all. And I tell I tell this to everyone: it's all digital. The rest of it is re, as as an individual artist is to uh, promote yourself and really um, you have to do the best that you can to get your work out there which I'm seeing a lot of them are, are doing it. And a lot of them have a lot of good following, uh, a lot of good followers so over time you know, the more work you put out, the more you know, things you do, that you know, bands everything together. That definitely seems to be the place where there's the most democratization in terms of the possibility of finding an audience, for example, and, and certainly being heard by people is, is online. Yeah. Certainly during these times with COVID and lockdown as well, it's increasingly more difficult to get people to come out to a gallery when, you know, they can't. That is absolutely right. So, um, you know, last year I did have a great show. Um, actually, my biggest show to date, which was um, with a collaboration of, of Daniels and... Um, CBC Toronto, um, uh, Calm Collective. So there's, there were about three, four, four different companies that came together and sponsored this, uh, my, my show last year, which was, it was huge. Um, we had over 700 people that came by in the two days. Um, and it, it showcased my colorblind collection. And it's very, very successful. So we wanted to, I wanted to do that again this year. And when I started creating this new body of work, Bloom, um, during, um, during the early, uh, late winter, early spring, right before we went into lockdown and, and the corona and COVID you know, really hit our shores, um, I was already planning all of this and getting sponsors on board. And then COVID hit, and that basically destroyed all the plans. However, I, you know, to me, I was like, you know, okay, so as far as I'm concerned, this year is written off. Um, but I'm not satisfied with that. What other way can we, um, when I say we, my team and I, can we put this work out there than having to wait to show it next year? Uh, and I, um, my wife is part of my team and she said, you know, what are the other galleries doing? And I mean, in the U S the major ones. Uh, um, so, you know, I started looking at galleries in New York and in Miami and Chicago and LA and everyone is doing online viewing rooms because no one can now come into to a gallery because of COVID. So I said, how about 
I create an online viewing room, digital and uh, virtual exhibit for this body of work um, and put it out there at least just show the world whatever happens happens and see you know see what happens with it and that's part of the whole idea of change right and adapting to change the world is constantly changing the question is are you changing with it right are you you know if you're not then you're going to be left behind so i said you know hey this is what's happening let's 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 try this with no expectations but with a lot of work being put behind it um so put it out there uh the digital uh virtual exhibit and boom exploded on its own um i've never had that many visitors to my website ever the total of, 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 of uh, users that came to my website in a two-month period from june to end of july uh was more than i ever had last year <laughs> <laughs> right um so it it, it kind of snow had the snowball effect and you know, it, and you know, people people started buying, which was quite amazing, right? Not just not just prints, but also originals. So also started seeing a lot of revenue, uh, you know, revenue go up substantially during a time when I felt that this that the year was complete write off, and 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 I think that's that's because I decided not to give in to the idea that the year is a write off, and still put. Put, you know, put in work. Now, even though I didn't have a high expectations for it, I still put in the work and still thought, it still needs to get out there, right? Um, but whatever happens, happens. This way I don't get disappointed if, <laughs> if it was miserable. It was very, you know, it ended up being very successful. And I think over, when people saw that, wow, you're even thriving during a pandemic, you know, I decided to share those same ideas with other artists that I mentor. I said, guys, put your stuff online, right? This is what I did. Hey, it might work for you, it might not work, but you have just try it. How how did this look online? I mean, like, what's different different between what you uh, did for this exhibit versus just putting up a website and telling people to go there? It was all about user experience, right? The UX was, was completely different because um, having a regular website, people just go on there, they see, oh wow, okay, so this is this collection, and it's very simple, very straightforward. However, with the the user experience, which you know. Thanks to my wife, uh, she was she sat me down and she was like, "Listen, you have to make this as simple, user friendly as possible to encourage people because as users we're very lazy. We want things put right in front of us. So um, if if you see the digital um, the virtual exhibit, uh, it's, it's it's basically a story. It tells a whole story. There's a, there's a visual and audio co component to, to to everything. Uh, in addition to that." The, you know, each time you see the new painting, underneath there was a button to shop for prints. So if you're interested in buying a print for this, you know, you're able, to, there's that action there for you to actually jump on it, which was never there on my website before. So the, you know, changing the, the user experience improved the revenue, right? Because uh, you know, people can see prints. There's a tab of prints. You can click on it and you can shop right away. However, put it right in front of their face and saying, hey, prints are available for this specific painting, go ahead. And then create an options, right? Because part of what I also thought was, right now, people are, you know, if they've lost their jobs, people are in, you know, in dire economic situations. However, there's some people that would love to support. But how do we become, how, how are we more conscious of, you know, what is happening? So I created a very smaller print which I you know, decided to sell for a cheaper price compared to the rest of all the other prints. So you know, if you couldn't afford a regular print, hey, there's still another option that you can afford. Um, so you're kind of thinking about this, you know, uh, people's economic situation. However, people still bought all the different size prints because you know, people ask me why did, did, I, did I see an increase? And there's several reasons. People are home. No one's going anywhere. So people realize they're looking at their bare walls in their homes and realize <laughs> that my house looks terrible and I need to put some art in the wall because prior to this, people were barely home. They were in their office and after they were done work, they were going to restaurants, going out for drinks. And every time they go home is really go home, get some rest. You wake up and you repeat the same thing again. But with COVID, everybody was home. And, and then people were not spending as much money going out. 
So a lot of people had, you know, the people, of course, that didn't lose their jobs, is what I'm speaking of specifically, uh, disposable income that they either A, are saving, or B, decided to spend it on things that actually mattered to them. And part of that happens to be art. Yeah, and there's a, an increase in comfort in buying things online. I mean, part of COVID is now everybody just buys everything by delivery. That's right. right. So why not get your art delivered too? I mean, and, and if you've made it so simple that not only are they, it, it's kind of like going to the gallery, seeing the painting, but have the painting come off the wall, do a little dance for you. And you go, oh, and by the way, here's the gift shop right beside it. That's right. So you can just go and pick one up, but get the big <laughs> one, get the small one, get the original. Who cares? You got it. They're all in the store. So it seems like you have no problem staying motivated to work. Do you ever take a break? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, if, even, even if I choose not to take a break, um, my mind uh, physically tells me my, you're, you're going to stop. Flow is one of these things that, you know, athletes get it, artists, musicians, we all get it. Uh, and some people stay in it for a longer period of time than others do. And some people don't know, even know how to control flow. Um, so one thing that I, I started to realize when I started creating was uh, the importance of flow, how to control it, and how to snap out of it. Because if not, that's where uh, your question comes in is how do you balance um, your, your work life with your personal life? Where's, where's that balance? And that balance is understanding flow. So I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, when I first started, I didn't understand it. I understood the, the power of flow and what it meant because I would be in flow creating for 10 hours nonstop. I wouldn't eat. I wouldn't shower. I wouldn't do anything. I just wake up and just jump into it because my studio is in my home. So it's very easy for me to create. However, I don't live by myself. I have a wife and a dog that also need my attention. So um, at first it, it, it was disastrous because, you know, I'll just tell the dog, hey, buddy, on your own, go talk to <laughs> go talk to your mom and you know my wife is oh, or the time you know she was still at work at the time and she'll wait till you know he'll have to go out he will go out the whole day except in the morning and it was just not fair to the dog so i said you know i can't if i'm a pet owner i need to take care of my pet and take him out no regardless of whether I, I'm, I'm creating so creating breaks and understanding you know work is work but you have to snap out of it and manage your own personal life because if not they're going to be problems um so what i would do is i would create a schedule for myself okay i get up like i'm i get up most of the time now like i'm going to work i wake up um not necessarily at eight or seven or eight um but now i wake up around nine nine fifteen but like i'm going to work now i get up and i just go directly to, to work and i just look at the canvas okay what am i going to do today okay this is what i'm going to do this is what i'm going to do and I said, okay, so I'll do this for the next four hours. And by one o'clock, I need to take this guy out. Just, you know, have him, you know, go to the park, clear my mind. And probably in that time, I can also be inspired and see some of the mistakes. Or not necessarily mistakes, but see some mistakes, but see other ways to improve. Come with what we call in art fresh eyes of really looking at it again and seeing things differently. Because when you stare at something for such a long period of time, you don't even see the mistakes sometimes. So, you know, take an hour or two off, come back, create till about five, six to what, you know, to my wife comes back from the office and then stop and spend time with my wife and, and talk about her day and just come back. And, and once you build this routine, it becomes something for you. And I will still create again. I will go back to create and probably around 10 ish when she's, when she goes to bed. And I'll create till early hours in the morning, probably about two or three. And then I stop. Uh, and it's about stopping. It's hard to stop because when you're creating, you don't want to stop, right? It's about knowing, okay, three o'clock, I got to cut, I gotta cut, cut it and just go, go to sleep, get some rest. And it's, it's being able to manage and balance both and creating that routine that allows you to spend time with your family, spend time with the ones you love, and take away, you know, kind of come out from that flow. And this year was kind of hard because we were in lockdown. So, so I, she's right there. She, she's working from home. I'm working here. Um, when I create, I love a lot of loud music. I couldn't do that because she was in, in the meetings and I was losing my mind. I was like, what am I going to do? Um, but then trying, trying to adjust to that 
Um, but because she's home, we get to spend more time together. So when she's on a break, I will take a break and spend time with her. So it's about, you know, finding out that, that, that balance and that routine that works for you. It's, you know, being where you're able to, you know, balance both. And also she's a very, she's, you know, she, my wife is a very in, integral part of my creative team. Um, she you know, provides a lot of advice. She's, she's my biggest critic because everyone tells me that, oh, Benny, you're so amazing. You're such a wonderful artist. And she tells me this painting looks like shit and uh, I don't like it. And, and it's just, it's real. And she might not like it and that's completely fine. And I ask her why she doesn't, but it allows me to know that, you know, if you're being told every single time that you're so good, you, you actually, you lose, you, you lose, what's, what is it? The, the perspective. The, yeah, perspective and the ambition to get better. Right. So, um, you know, that's key. So that for me is, you know, routine and being able to stop sometimes and, and as they say, stop and smell the flowers. Right. Uh, is key and important. Well, I was going to ask you, and maybe the question really should be for your wife, but what sort of advice would you give to somebody who's just starting out? Comparison is the fastest success killer. Do not compare yourself to anybody, period. We could, because we are all different, we're all unique, and we're all special in our own, in our own way. Uh, gratitude is key. In life, not just in your career, in life, if I wasn't grateful of that gift that I received on Christmas Day 2014, I would not be, I would not have found my purpose in life. Three, um, if you're not learning, you're not succeeding. You have to keep learning every single day. And, you know, you have to find lessons in things that you don't even think there was a lesson in. That's also an important thing. Attitude. Attitude is so important. Like uh, I mentioned this earlier, our attitude towards life is, 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 is what determines life's attitude towards us. If you have a shitty attitude, you will have pretty much a shitty life and, and, and a shitty business, right? If, if, if you have an optimistic, positive attitude, you would see that produce substantial results in, you, in your life and in your business. And these are, these are things that regardless of your discipline, regardless of what you do, whether you're a painter, you're an actor, you're a comedian, you're a poet, whatever it is that you do, these things, these are fundamental foundation pieces that will help you thrive and succeed in anything that you do when it comes to making a living. And I think it's important for people to know that because these things, no matter whether you're successful or you're climbing that ladder, you're still going to need them. Even when you get to the top, because if you get to the top and then you forget about, you have a bad attitude, bro, you're, you're coming down real quick. <laughs> that's, that's one. Two, and Cause remember, the people you meet on your way up are the same ones you're going to meet on your way down, right? And then if you're not learning, then you're not going to climb, you're not going to climb higher because you might think that, that your level of success right now is like the pinnacle, that's it. No, that's just one point. So if you don't keep learning, you're not going to get to the next point. And if you, if you compare yourself when you're successful, oh yeah, I'm so good, you know, I'm better than this person, that person, and that, whatever the case. If you start to compare yourself, you're going to see things change. So for me, these are, the, these are the key things that I try to remember and try to tell myself every single day. It's, and it, don't get me wrong. I have days where I am not in the best um, mental state. I am not as optimistic. I am not as positive. However, I look around and I see what I have. And I'm grateful for what I have. And once I, once I start to thank the universe and thank God for what I have, I start to see my attitude change and I try to be more positive and those things start to, they start to change things around you, right? I always say, I treat people 10 times better than I like to be, I want to be treated. Because when you do that, you would notice how everything changes around you, right? And it's, it's sometimes just the smallest things. The smallest things, your mindset and your attitude, it's a very small thing. Uh, we, 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 we go through a lot uh, uh, at times, and we bring that into our disciplines. We bring the outside noise inside, right? 
So I'll give you a perfect example. Today, I ran to the store this morning to go get something. And when I was at the store, uh, you know, I just woke up, so I was a little bit edgy. And I, I was trying to you know, buy flowers for my wife because um, I like to surprise her all the time. And the price that was there was not the price that was on the that came up when, when we ran it through the machine. And I was a little bit ticked off by the response and the service that was being given to me by the lady. But I said, I don't know what she's going through. I don't know what, what her day is like. I don't know who, you know, before me, what was the last customer like, right? And or am I just reflecting? Is it just, a, am I just, you know, I'm just reflecting what I'm feeling on her. How about if I change the way I'm talking to her, change my approach? Well, let's see what will happen. And I did. And automatically, um, she said, you know, you're, you're very nice about, you know, how you respond to me. Because last time this happened, you know, the lady told me to fuck off. And I was like, that's, that's sad. And she was like, yeah, and, you know, sometimes we just need a little bit of kindness in this world. And I, you know, when she said that to me, I just remembered. If I didn't change the way I was responding to her, you know, it's, it's almost as if, you know, we create that cycle. And I, I would have probably been, you know, had a certain type of attitude the moment we started this interview. It's the same thing. We control the way we are. We control our attitudes. The more we start to show kindness and empathy towards others, and we start to think and change our attitudes, we see things change. And this is just fundamentals. It doesn't have to do with business or anything. But you would see that changing your business also. So, Benny, tell me, where can people find you? My website is uh, www.bennybing.com. Uh, you can find me on social, Instagram, uh, at Benny Bing. And you can also find me on Twitter, at Benny Bing. Thank you so much for being on the show and sharing with us how you make a living. Thanks for having me. It was definitely a pleasure. Subscribe to Making a Living Show on Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, and pretty much anywhere else you get your podcasts. For more on the show, visit makingalivingshow.com and follow along on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Making a Living Show is produced by Next Exit Media and hosted by me, Roby Levy. Thanks for listening.